We have a reading. We just sang Psalm 139. It's a beautiful psalm. I'm going to read a selection from this psalm. The Psalm 139. O Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high I cannot attain it. Where can I go to escape from your spirit? For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. And I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance, and in your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them, but they are more than the sand. I come to the end I am still with you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Isn't that beautiful? The gospel reading is from the Gospel of John. Chapter 1, verses 43 to 51. Listen now for the word of the Lord. So the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip, and he said to Philip, follow me. And now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to Nathanael, we found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. And when Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, Jesus said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael asked him, Where did you come to know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. And Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. And Jesus answered, Do you believe me because I told you that I saw you under a fig tree? You'll see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Friends, for the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Pause with me for a moment of prayer. Holy One, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts together be acceptable to you. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, there are endless books and articles and confessions and arguments about what the Bible is. So many people gather around this text and we commit ourselves to studying it day after day, 
through so many generations and cultures and histories that the Bible takes on its own mythical presence in our society. Did anyone get nervous when I was flipping through this? I'm like, I don't think I've ever seen anyone actually touch the pulpit Bible, let alone turn the pages. But sometimes I like to remember that everything that ever happens is just people doing things. People who decide to do something rather than nothing. And in the case of Psalm 139, we have this record of a person who decided to write instead of just think. We have a person who decided to journal instead of just pray. Once upon a time, there was a person who had an experience of the divine that was so moving that they sat down and put pen to paper to capture that experience. And it was a person just like you, with hopes and with fears, with successes and with failures. And that person wrote, Oh, God, you search me and you know me. You discern my thoughts from afar. Where can I go to escape you? You know me better than I know myself. Search me, God. Know me. Lead me in the everlasting life. Can you imagine a moment like that? Fortunately for us, we get to read that poem. And like so much other poetry, Psalm 139 can help us put words to feelings that we feel here and now. And at that pure level of this poetry puts words to a feeling, this is one of my favorite psalms. Because I find it deeply comforting and affirming to be able to express that God knows me deeply and loves me nonetheless. I find it deeply comforting and affirming that I don't have to change before God will be present to me. And when I then consider that this poem is part of our sacred scripture, I find it deeply moving that throughout generations, those words have resonated with faithful people that I can now find community with all across the ages and across cultures. God knows us more deeply and fully than we know ourselves. And in that, we all have common ground. God sees every part of me, and God still welcomes me. God sees every part of you, and God still welcomes you. God sees every part of us, and God welcomes us, just as we are. Our minds, our actions, our bodies... We don't need to change before God welcomes us. Isn't that good news? You and I are the same in that way. You, me, everybody. And so this poem is an expression of God's deep graciousness. The person who wrote this, they had no knowledge of the saving life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They were just reflecting on their own religious tradition and the presence of the divine in their life. They had a sense, it seems, of God's graciousness that we see in the life of Jesus. It's the same divine presence being witnessed in each case. We might also find similarity here to what Paul invokes in Acts 17 when he talks about God being the one in whom we live, in whom we move, in whom we have our being. We might also find some similarity here with God describing themselves as I am. All these different witnesses point to a sense that God is what is. We're invited to recognize that our lives are embedded in God. We are invited to abide in the divine It reminds me of a story from David Foster Wallace. Has anyone ever read any David Foster Wallace? He, uh, 
he did this commencement speech and he told this story. He said, there are two young fish swimming along. They happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way. And the older fish nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a little bit and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and says, what the hell is water? (laughs) Do you think fish know that they're wet? (laughs) I suppose we could stretch the metaphor a little and say that fish definitely know when they're out of the water. We know what happens. Can we recognise that we live, that we move, that we have our being in God. Because once we recognize that, might we embrace the idea that God, who suffuses every fiber of creation, who knows our thoughts, who knows the words on our tongues before they're formed, who knows the desires of our hearts, and here's the really weighty part, might we embrace that God knows all of this and welcomes us just as we are. That is the essence of grace. Now, I recognize that this deep knowing is not always a comforting thought. When the psalmist says, where can I go to escape from you? We might read that and go, yes, thank you. I would like to escape from that knowing. (laughs) Because there can be a deep fear in being known. Being known is a very vulnerable thing because to be known is to risk being hurt or to risk being rejected. Being known might feel more to you like being exposed. And if the feeling that this psalm evokes for you is not a comforting one, that's okay. We don't all have to feel the same thing. It's okay. But... If I might invite you to consider that if the fear of being known is connected to the fear of being rejected, know that the one about whom the psalm speaks is the one who is grace, who is love, who is mercy, and who is peace. I remember when I first became Christian, I was a 16-year-old, I'd spend hours praying, I felt like hours, I don't know if it was hours, <laughs> felt like hours to a 16 year old. I'd spent all this time praying, hoping to feel what I thought the presence of God should feel like. I thought that if I could just be still enough, if I could say the right words, if I could be morally pure enough, God might visit me in a special way. And I wish that I'd just spent some more time with Psalm 139 at that time in my life. And I wish that I had felt the revolutionary grace that God is with us just as we are. God sees us, knows us, and abides in us and abides with us. God says, yeah, I know. I'm still with you. And it's that kind of knowing that Nathaniel experiences from Jesus. So initially, Nathaniel is quite prejudiced towards his friend Philip's invitation. Philip says, we found the one whom Moses and the prophets wrote, which is something Nathaniel would have been looking forward to. But then Philip says, it's Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel's countenance sours, and he's like, what good can come from Nazareth? Now, we don't need to malign Nathaniel for his reaction here. We are all products of our environment. We can maybe hear echoes of our own prejudices in Nathaniel's words. Notice, though, that Nathaniel nearly missed the word of God because the word of God didn't appear the way that Nathaniel expected it to. There's the Jesus of our imagination, and then there's the actual message of God calling us to recognize and to be recognized. Even people with prejudices are known by God and even people with prejudices are called by God. These prejudices will get transformed just like Nathaniel's. 
When we think about Christ in the world, where do we expect Christ to be found? In power? Born into a prominent family? Following all the rules? Following all the laws? Today's a good day to reread Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail, if you haven't read it before. He quotes St. Augustine and says, an unjust law is no law at all. It's a good weekend to revisit that letter. We should learn from Nathaniel that Christ's appearance in the world will probably not be what we expect or probably even what we like. Our job as faithful people is to pray as the psalmist did, search me, know me, lead me in the way everlasting, so that we might allow our perception to be shaped by God so that we can recognize Christ when Christ appears. Nathaniel's prejudice didn't stop Jesus from encountering him and neither do any of our prejudices stop us from encountering Christ. And it didn't take much for Jesus to break through that prejudice and for Nathaniel to see Jesus truly a rabbi, the son of God, the king of Israel. It was a profound about face. We can almost hear Jesus laughing as he says, you believe me because I told you I saw you under a fig tree? Like it was that easy? Mate, you're going to see greater things than this. Remember Jacob's ladder that you know about because you're a really true Israelite in whom there is no deceit? Jacob's ladder connected heaven and earth. Well, guess what? I'm it, mate. Follow me and see what a heaven and earth connected life looks like. It's going to amaze you. And so it might amaze us. Just like Nathaniel, Jesus knows us and Jesus calls us, yes, us, us. Just as we are, to live that heaven and earth connected life. Amidst our prejudices, amidst our doubts, amidst our mistakes, amidst our best efforts, amidst our expectations, the voice of God is saying, I know you. Believe me, I know. And, yes, I still want you. Come and follow me. Join me in the life that connects heaven and earth. Let me lead you to the kind of life that death cannot destroy. And so, friends, I pray that we can hold ourselves and each other in that grace and trust that God is calling us into goodness. Because I have faith that we will see greater things than we have anticipated as we follow God in that life of grace. And so may the world transform around us, among us, within us, through us, and in spite of us. In Christ's name, amen.